I am so, so happy to have my friend Michael Lush on with us today. Michael is CEO and founder of Replacer Mortgage and Replacer University. Um, he had been, it's probably been about a year ago, he came in and did a training uh, in the group, and we're so happy that he provided that. We're going to discuss that again today uh, a little bit, but I want, I, what I really don't know about Michael is his story, like how he started off in entrepreneurship, and I think that's going to be really interesting, and we're going to get into that. Michael, I would like you to just to kind of introduce yourself and kind of tell us who you are and what you do. Yeah. So as he said, I'm the CEO of Replace Your Mortgage, which also uh, is Replace Your University. We're in, inside of Replace Your University. We kind of get into a litany of other financial topics where Replace Your Mortgage is very specific to talking about how bad mortgages are and how much they suck and what the alternatives are. You know, a lot of people don't realize that financing real estate, you don't have to use a mortgage. There are other uh, means of financing real estate. Uh, our favorite is obviously lines of credit and simple interest lines of credit, which we can get into here later. I started this company in, nine years ago. So this is my ninth year doing this um, out of a closet in my home. Uh, I was a 17-year mortgage vet. So I worked for mortgage companies uh, anywhere from just a loan officer starting out to senior executive at, as, at multiple firms, uh, federal savings banks, things of that nature. So we kind of rose through the ranks pretty quickly because I was good at sales. And I wouldn't say I was good at sales. I had a very keen sense of how to work the numbers in my favor. You know, I've got a, a call center here at the office for my account executives. And anytime it's quiet, we were just having this conversation. Anytime it's quiet, it just drives me nuts. You know, we have hundreds of thousands of leads. And then my account executives are just waiting for the phone to ring. It's like, oh, that drives me nuts. You make the phone ring. Uh, so that was what I was good at is, you know, I, I didn't I didn't have idle hands. I always needed something to do. It's kind of like in this interview. I'm not sitting at a desk. I can't sit down. This desk is actually one of those standing desks. I think, Doug, you're probably doing the same thing, are you I not? Am. Yeah, I am. I can't sit still. We have board meetings and things like that. And then, you know, we've got a big conference room and flat screen TVs and uh, cameras all around. And everybody can kind of see what I'm doing. Everybody's sitting down at the, the conference table and I'm just up walking around pacing. So it, that was, you know, some people will call it uh, a disability, you know, having ADHD and I don't medicate. <laughs> I'm against the types of forms of, of medication for ADHD. So it's really my superhuman power is having ADHD. I can't sit still. I got to stay busy. And that's really what made me successful in the mortgage business. And it was uh, in 2009, to be exact. Um, so 14 years ago, I had a mentor who owned a hedge fund, wealthy individual at the time, worth upper hundreds of millions of dollars. I think today he's a billionaire. And uh, he he was a mentor of mine, but he also gave the capital to my firm to, to resurrect after the ashes of the 2007-2008 mortgage meltdown. And he would come to my office from time to time to mentor me, also to check on his money, right? He wanted to make sure <laughs> everybody was being efficient with his $25 million and that, uh, you know, we were doing the best that we could so that he could get a, a good rate of return on his money. But um you know, there was a couple uh, occasions where I tried to get his fear of influence. Like, look, this this guy's where I want to be. And not necessarily money. Uh, you know, we've talked about that. Who doesn't want to have hundreds of millions of dollars? But I don't need it. What I really want is freedom, just true freedom and not just financial freedom. The freedom is being able to do what you want to do when you want to do it without any type of oversight or regulation. And that's where he was. So I wanted to be in his fear of influence. And so I said, look, you know, you technically own this mortgage company by default through the, the funds that you've um, given us to, so that we can resurrect after the meltdown. Um, it would behoove you not to allow me to be introduced to your sphere of influence and allow me to do mortgages for them. If they're doing mortgages, they're doing big mortgages, big mortgages or big paychecks and commissions. And we can get into that here in a little bit, too. Um, so it means you get your money back faster. And that's when he took 15 minutes and explained this to me. And it really started the beginning of Replace Your Mortgage. And he said, he, this is the sentence that stuck with me, will stick with me for the rest of my life. It says, Michael, mortgages are financial crack to middle America. The poor can't afford them and the rich don't use them. And he said, honestly, you're peddling dope. You're peddling financial crack. You're the dope dealer. That did not sit well with me. <laughs> so I set out on a journey, honestly, to prove him wrong because you know, I had spent my whole career uh, in the mortgage industry thinking that I was helping people. And I, and I was, you know, saving them on a monthly basis and getting them in a home and 
helping them pay some things off. But it's really it really is crack once you dive into the numbers of it and how the system actually works. It's highly addictive. Mortgages are. Um, so I set out on a journey really to prove him wrong because I thought if I'm smart enough to prove him wrong, then I've earned the right to be inside of his sphere of influence. So I hired a CPA actuary, my business partner to this day, Matt Workman, borderline genius. Uh, don't ever tell him that, but every now and then he'll <laughs> read like this. And uh, so we we set out for about a year to try to poke holes in the strategy that he had, had taught me. It took 15 minutes. He didn't really teach me the entire uh, system, but you know, just this one topic of utilizing simple interest lines of credit to finance really everything about your life, not even just real estate. And we could poke holes in it. Uh, the more we tried to prove him wrong, we proved him right. And it was in 2013, I had a marketing mentor by the name of Jimmy Harding. I like to give credit where credit is due. And he had a workshop and he said, I need you to come down to this workshop and uh, we're going to build an entire business around the strategy uh, that you had because he had heard me on another, uh, it wasn't a podcast, but it was uh, an interview for Mortgage Success or some some type of magazine where he said, for the first 45 minutes where you're talking about how to grow mortgage branches, it was very boring. No one really wants to hear that. Maybe mortgage branch managers and maybe loan officers, but the rest of the country does not want to hear that. It was the one question that was asked to you that really changed what I thought and why I thought you needed to build a business around it. And it was, what is the golden nugget in the mortgage industry that either people don't want to know and they're ignoring or that people should know? And that's when I was like, this is really shooting myself in the foot to tell people that mortgages suck. And here I am explaining to Mortgage Success Magazine how, you know, this is how you grow branches and, and pedal more financial crack. And so I said, whatever, screw it. And they're asking for value, so I'm going to do it. And I told him, I said, I don't consume mortgages. I'm the expert in the industry and I don't even consume them. So why should you? What I really consume and what I put my house on was a first lien position, home equity line of credit. First lien position, we can get into that here in a little bit. But my whole house, instead of it being on a mortgage, was on a simple interest line of credit. And instead of utilizing banks like checking accounts and savings accounts, I was utilizing my line of credit because it's a, a unique tool compared to a mortgage. It's not a closed in product where money can only go in freely and not come out freely. A HELOC money can move in and out freely. So I started using my HELOC like my checking account. And because I was cash flow positive, meaning I had more money coming in than what I was spending, I was evaporating the debt on that house uh, with really no sweat. I didn't have to change my budget. We were, you know, because I went broke in 2007, 2008. So we were definitely on a budget, but I didn't have to change my lifestyle to accomplish this. And three and a half years later, my house was paid off. And that was the only time I paid off my house because now you know how money works. Um, we, we leverage, but uh, I did it just for that pat on the back. It took three and a half years and we paid off that house. It was amazing. Wow. Wow. And, and, and now you're growing into replace your university. Mm -hmm. um, that's something you started how, many, how long ago? It was about a year and a half ago. Oh, yeah. Nice. Um, you know, we had some personnel uh, on the team that was kind of against uh, growth and, and expanding. And there was, in Replace Your Mortgage, we started getting into other arenas because what Replace Your Mortgage does, we call it the Buried Treasure Detection System. It unlocks capital that you didn't know you had freely and efficiently and at very cheap cost of funds. Again, utilizing simple interest lines of credit. So when you have access to capital, we started understanding the entire banking system. You know, now, Sit on the board of a bank. I'm part of joint ventures of banks. I help banks create equity products that are not only bank friendly, but they are consumer friendly. And let's just be honest. If they're not bank friendly, they're not going to push it. Right. So it has to be both. It has to be a win win. So I help banks create equity products. And uh, so we started getting into arenas where it's like, all right, we're leveraging this money. What is the best ways to leverage it? Is it real estate? Is it insurance? Is it trading? Things of nature. So it expanded from there. We, we got into day trading. So we created Replace Your Dollar. Uh, we got into insurance and how to create your own family bank and trust, uh, which is a really cool topic. If you think Replace Your Mortgage is cool, Replace Your Banker takes it to a whole different level. Uh, so we started getting into how to create your own family bank. Because let's be honest, if you're borrowing money, even though it's more efficient and less archaic than a mortgage by utilizing a home equity line of credit, you're still paying interest to a third party. 
So how cool would it be that if you were paying interest on a loan that you borrowed from yourself, that interest goes back to you tax free? So that's how we what we call mirroring, where you can have a dollar parked somewhere earning interest, but that same dollar can be in one or two other places also earning interest. Again, this is what the rich and wealthy do. So success leaves clues. We, we learned these strategies and it only made sense that since we're getting into all these other topics to create Replace Your University, where we have replace your mortgage, replace your dollar, replace your banker, replace your employer, and replace your mindset, which is a, a totally different topic as well. Yeah, and, and very important and crucial to have, right, around all of this. So mindset is everything. It's, it's really the foundation. So I, I want to dive into the whole money thing a little bit deeper. So I know you just spoke about all the things that uh, your you and your team offer. Can you talk about how important and game changing it is to know uh, how money works, how money really works? Yes. Well, let me cut this down real quick because I'm, I'm looking at my camera here and I got so many lights on me that it's going to give a ginger like me sunburn. <laughs> so, you know, let's talk about the, the banking system. A mortgage prior to 1913 looked incredibly different than the modern day mortgage that we consume today, right? So the mortgage prior to 1913 really resembled in many fashions a home equity line of credit. Money can move in and out freely 24-7. So let's take a scenario. You're a farmer and you've got a $200,000 farm, which would have been a mega farm back in those days, given the, the cost of inflation. So yeah, that's like probably thousands of acres prior to 1913 compared to what it is today. But you've got a 200,000 dollars farm that let's say you owe 100 grand on. And you're like, you know what? I need to buy equipment so that I can expand this farm and grow some crops. You walk down to the bank that day and say, I need $10,000 to buy equipment to grow crops. That day, they give you 10 grand because you had equity, right? You had $100,000 worth of equity in that farm. So there's no problem when you grow the crops, sell the crops. You can just deposit your money into this mortgage for safekeeping. So money can move in and out freely. And you hear the stories of our grandfathers and great grandfathers that, you know, back in my day, you know, they walked to school uphill both ways. <laughs> so, but, um, you know, we, we paid our home off in less than 10 years. Right. There's a lot of components to that. In my opinion, better generation, probably more educated. They read books for entertainment as opposed to watching Netflix. Um, so they were more educated. They also had better financial tools, quite frankly. Uh, you know, the mortgage being one where money can move in and out freely. But that all changed in 1913. So what do you think it was in 1913? It really changed the, the game for not only mortgages, but the banking system in general. The way the money moves. Let, let's, I'll give you a clue. It's an entity that was created. Uh, the the The... What oh, you, you had it on the tip of your tongue. The, the Federal Reserve. Exactly. Which is yeah. neither federal nor <laughs> reserve. Yeah. Yeah. So let me cut this off too. I was going to use it to kind of draw some examples on here, but I'm seeing in my, my lighting here, my videographer and, and light people just, uh, they're not here. They don't wake up as early as I do. <laughs> so uh, it's neither federal nor is it reserve. Um, so what it does is it gives the banks a unique capability. It just came on again. <laughs> it's got a mind of its own. So it gives the it's banks smart technology. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. You you can touch it and do all kinds of things, talk to it, but if you want to cut it off, and I don't know, it's a problem. So it gives banks unique capability of executing what's called fractional reserve lending, right? So it got to the banks and said, listen, bank, if you have one dollar in deposits, you can lend out ten dollars in loans. So very cool magic trick. It's literally a stroke of a key. And here's the other thing. Let's say you had fifty thousand dollars in a bank and you go to the bank today and ask for fifty thousand dollars in cash. What do you think the bank's going to tell you? What's your credit score? No, no, you, you've got a check in the savings account. But you want your 50,000 that day. I oh. gave you 50 grand. I want my 50 grand back. So you're, you're moving accounts. It's virtually impossible because they don't actually store cash. Everything is a, is a, a stroke of, of a computer key. Oh, right. Yeah, they don't store cash. Um, so it, it, again, it's fractional reserve lending. So 
for every dollar you put in, they got $10. For every $10 you put in, they got $100. For every $100,000 you put in, they have a million, right, to lend out. It's a very powerful magic trick. You know, here's a good example, Doug. If I gave you a dollar bill and you snapped your fingers and you turned it into a $10 bill, who's on that? Andrew Jackson? I forget who it is. So I'll give you a George Washington and you turn it into Andrew Jackson. That's a really profitable and cool magic trick. Your next question out of me is, how many more dollars you got to give me, right? Yep. yep. The banks are no different. So again, uh, I'm involved in banking. So every meeting, the meetings are centered around one specific topic. And it's how do we grow core deposits? How do we get more depositors coming in so that we can lend out more money? It's called arbitrage. So Doug, if you give me a dollar and I owe you interest on that dollar, but I can then lend it out at massive interest rates well above what you charged me, that's called arbitrage, right? So, and some people will look at, let's say you borrow money at 4% and you lend it out at 8%. What is your rate of return? I'm giving you a lot of quizzes here. And the, the 4%. Wrong. Right. It's the margin. No. The that's margin. That's what I thought. Okay. 4%, 8%. That, that's four, right? That's the difference. Yeah. 4%. Now, let me change it from a percentage point to a dollar so that makes most people understand. If I give you $4 and you turn it into eight, what is your rate of return? $4. 100%. Oh, right. 100% percentage. 100% rate of return. You yes. double your money. Yes. Banks act no differently. So think about it. We're walking into the bank front door. We look to our right, and the banker is like, hey, deposit your funds here, and I'll tell you what the national average right now for deposits, which is astonishing because banks are flush with digital cash, and they haven't raised the average uh, uh, return on return rate for checking and savings accounts, but it's 0.24%, right? 0.24. So you look to the banker, and they're like, hey, deposit your funds here. We're offering a, a crazy high rate of return of 0.24%. Okay, so I deposit my funds there. Then you look to the right or left, I should say, and there sits a loan officer. They're like, get a loan over here. We have loans as low as 5%. All the teller did was walk your money over there and you're borrowing your own funds. Think about the rate of return on that. So for folks that are entrepreneurs or probably investors as well, Guess what the negative rate of return is on that investment? 3,600%. Negative. But what wow. was the rate of return for the bank? Positive 3,600%, <laughs> right? So again, the power of arbitrage. I don't care if we have nuclear war. Banks is a business model that will always be profitable and always be in existence. You, you look at every major city you go to. What is the tallest building? What's the tallest skyscraper? Who owns that? Banks. It is a massive, <laughs> massive profit center. So there is, there is no laws or regulations that prevent the American citizen from doing and executing on the exact same strategies that the banking system does. And that's what we expose. And so a mortgage was changed after 1913 because the banks got together and said, all right, Obviously, deposits are extremely important. So how do we grow core deposits? And they looked at what the average American, where they were storing their cash at the time, was in their mortgage because it was liquid. Money can move in and out freely, right? So they said, we got to stop that. We need to come up with what's called a segregation income system, right? So it segregates your cash flow. So they made a mortgage, the modern day mortgage. Again, when I say mortgage, again, by the way, let me reverse course here. A mortgage is old French for death pledge. Just so we're all clear, 99% of us Americans are going out and refinancing and signing up for a mortgage. It's the root of it is death pledge. So you're, you're signing a contract to death. And most, most Americans, you know, most Americans don't pay off one home in 30 years. But there is a couple societies around the world that never adopted our banking system. One that's very popular is Australia. The average Australian pays two homes off in 14 years. They also have the highest rate of second home ownership, meaning they have a primary residence and a vacation home. And those two homes get paid off an average of 14 years because what I'm explaining to you, they learn in high school, right, about money and finance and how the banking system works. 
So they came up with a mortgage work and made it closed in. That was the key. Let's make it so that money can move in freely, but it can't come out freely. It's a closed in product, which really was the catalyst for a lot of other products like car loans, personal loans, mm -hmm. anything that's an installment loan, student loans, right? Money goes in freely, doesn't come out freely. So what does that force you as the consumer to do? Are you now going to put 100% of your resources and cash flow into your mortgage knowing that it's trapped? No, because when it's time to pay your bills and utilities, you can't. It's trapped. So a HELOC, a home equity line of credit, is the old way of financing real estate. Money can move in and out freely. If I put 10 grand into my HELOC today, guess how much I have available, depending on what the balance started out with and how much I've already paid it down. But guess how much is available to me today? Still got that 10,000. Yeah. I can take it out anytime I want, 24 7. And the, the cool part about the digital age now is I put money in, I, could, I just use an app on my phone and say, okay, I actually want to take the 10 grand. I want to move it over here. And within a split second, it's moved. Money moves in and out freely. Here's the key to that. What does that do for you as the consumer? Now it gives you the confidence to do what Dave Ramsey tries to preach on, which <laughs> Price and beans and the you know pay extra towards your mortgage. Less than two percent of Americans actually pay extra on their mortgage because they know that it's trapped. Should they need need to have access to it, the, there's two expensive ways to do it. One refinance, which costs thousands of dollars, right? Even if you went to a lower rate, what are you doing? You're starting the amortization schedule all over again and going back to square one. Or two, sell the house. That's not attractive. So we want to have access to it where with the home equity line of credit, I've got access to it. So it gives me the confidence that, hey, even my nest egg, I can put towards my home equity line of credit, which reduces the balance. Thus, it reduces the interest I pay the next day. That's another difference between a mortgage and a home equity line of credit. So you put money in today, tomorrow, I'm paying less interest. On a mortgage, you're going to have to wait a long time before you're actually paying less interest on that mortgage because you chunked towards it, right? But again, I'm liquid. So if life events happen, I have access to my capital. If opportunities, you know, your, your group is probably an abundance mindset group where they're always looking for opportunities. They're entrepreneurs, right? You know, you're risk takers. You're, you're looking for opportunities. So when opportunities present itself, I am massively liquid. I have access to my capital within a split second to go capitalize on those opportunities. You know, a story that I had was a previous business partner. He had a neighbor who was an attorney and um, you could tell he was falling on some hard times. Like his yard, the grass was growing up and whatnot. He was barely leaving the house and he's walking the dog. So he finally just, you know, asked him, he's like, hey man, what's up? I said, man, lost my job, got a divorce, and um, you know my house is uh, going to be foreclosed on in four days. He's like, dang, that sucks. So you got four days, right? So my former business partner's like, I got a proposition for you. How about I buy the house before it forecloses? It's going to save your credit score, right? And then I rent it back to you. And it looks like you know we need some repairs and stuff too. So I'm going to give you some cash so you can do some repairs and cut the yard and all that, which what does that do? Drives up the equity in the home. So if he had a mortgage and said, hey, I, I've got to pull out three, four hundred thousand dollars today because I have equity in it. Are you capable of doing that in a mortgage? No. What are they going to tell you? Well, it's going to be 30 or 45 days. We're going to need tax returns. We're going to need W-2s. We're going to need pay stubs. We're going to need to look at your bank statements and all that. We're going to have to get a verification of employment and verify with your employer. Then we got to get with a title company and then that's going to cost thousands of dollars. And then, oh, by the way, you're going to pay us origination points and underwriting fees and processing fees. You get the point. It, it's it's archaic, right? So if he had a mortgage, he could not have capitalized on that opportunity. But because he had a home equity line of credit, in a split second, he was able to pull cash out, buy the home, prevent it from foreclosure, and it turned into an asset for him, a cash flow asset. So now he's receiving rent so he obviously the rent that he's receiving from this attorney or former attorney at the time, I don't know if he ended up getting back on his feet and getting a new uh, legal job. But obviously there was a margin between what he owed on the house via his home equity line of credit, which again is an interest only payment versus the rent. So now he's got more cash flow. So hypothetically, let's say before this transaction, he had 10 grand coming in a month. Now he's got 12 grand coming in a month. 
Well, when you have higher cash flow, what do you think happens to the home equity line of credit when you increase your cash flow? It speeds up the pay down process. So and that, again, that's where we get into replace your banker and some of the other concepts of, hey, if you just want to be debt free, we found no better strategy to becoming debt free with, I wouldn't say ease, but without the rice and beans method and the gazelle like mentality method and on your existing budget, we haven't found anything better. But the liquidity is what gives you the ability to go acquire more cash flow assets. And again, your audience is entrepreneurs. How many cash flow assets do we want to acquire on a yearly or monthly basis to replace? Is may, do you have a lot of, uh, of your clients or, or audience that is what I would call W-2 capitalists? So they're still in a job earning a W-2, but they're, they're scaling up their side hustle? There's a portion of those, yes. Yeah. yeah. So think about that. If you got capital to not only scale up your side hustle, but go acquire other cash flow assets that complement your side hustle, you can e evict your employer or what I call fire your boss at a much faster pace, should if you want to. Some people are like, no, nah, I love my job. I like being told what to do. I like clocking in. <laughs> uh, that's fine. If you like it, no problem. But the, the point is, is it gives you options. At least it gives you the option to make those decisions and the decision is left up to you whether or not you fire your boss or not. Yeah, leverage. What I, what I hear all through what you're saying is what everyone would really wish they had with their money is leverage, right? Yeah. And with the, well, the what you do for people, that's what you give them is you give them leverage. Now, behind that, it's important that they have the education to properly place that leverage, right? And that's something else you and your team provide uh, we agree that the education system as it is, is, is built to kind of make people go into jobs, right? So what's missing in the education system is a way to, how do you become an entrepreneur? How do you build wealth? And that is something you and your team are helping uh, fill that void. So can you kind of talk about that a little bit? Yes. So I'm glad you brought that up. Uh, it, it was one of the big proponents behind Replace University and specifically Replace Your Employer. A replace Your Employer is, is a subset of Replace Your University that teaches entrepreneurship and how to create that side hustle and scale it so that you can fire your boss. You know, I'm somebody that I went to college. Uh, it was a higher end college with a, a good education. It took me five years, unfortunately, because I was a terrible student. I was a better athlete than I was a student. But uh, yeah, I was a bad student. It took me five years. And my major was business administration with a minor in marketing and finance, corporate finance. The, the, let me focus on the marketing because, you know, you're a marketer and your entrepreneurs are marketers, too. What I learned, well, I couldn't even tell you what I learned. And this, I'm dating myself, but that was uh, 24 plus years ago that I was in college. I don't even remember what I learned, but I can tell you that anything that I was taught about marketing was completely obsolete six months later. I and mean, you and I both know, I mean, if, if you're running <laughs> Facebook ads, the algorithms change. If you're doing YouTube ads, the algorithm changes. You know, when it comes to email marketing and you have X amount of unsubscribes and whatnot, you get, you know, not shadow banned, but yeah, you can get shadow banned on Instagram and things that have been there, done that, got the t-shirt <laughs> uh, and Facebook too. Uh, I got evicted from there. But anyways, you know, all these different things, th that industry changes and it's in the job training and mentorship that is really going to give you the best education. Now, We've prepared for education for our kids. I've got four boys right now. I got a fifth one on the way in a couple months. So we've prepared for higher education for them, depending on the field that they want to go in. So I'm I'm not an advocate for college, but I'm I am a proponent depending on the skill set. You want to be a plumber, no problem. Let's go to a skills trade uh, to your college. Uh, if you want to be a lawyer, I, yeah, I think you need to go to college. Uh, if you want to be a doctor, uh, it's a must. You, you've got to go to college. Those specialized skill sets, yeah, go to college. If you want to be an entrepreneur, get a mentor. That's the that's the life hack. That is the fast track to becoming an entrepreneur. It's not um, unfortunately through college. Does that answer your question? It, it does. What What are your thoughts about someone who goes to college and gets a business degree? Uh -huh. That's that's a worthwhile endeavor. It is. It, it gives you foundational pieces. So. You know, obviously, as a finance uh, minor and a business administration major, uh, I had some foundations there that I got in college, like, you know, the, obviously the math, the accounting, counting one and counting two, corporate finance, some of those things um, that definitely gave me a leg up when starting a business and running a business. But once you get to the point of scaling, 
Um, and, and, you know, there's a whole education of how to scale a business too. But once you get to the point of scaling, you need to replace yourself. You need to delegate and elevate in your business. So am I the bookkeeper in my business? No, we have a bookkeeper. Am I the CFO in our business? No, we have a CFO. Am I the operations manager just because I had a business administration uh, major? No, we have someone that does that because I need to stay in my wheelhouse of genius and I need to let other people elevate us in their wheelhouse of geniusness too. So, you know, if you're a solopreneur, all right, that, that's something that you have to work towards. And that's not something that you could probably flip the switch on and do today. Um, but yeah, there, there's a whole topic on scaling a business that, that we could get into as well. My wife and I are clients of yours from the Replace Your Mortgage. Yeah. And uh, but it's, it's, it's life changing. I'll, I'll just say that. Um, but what I want you to bring up to other people, you kind of alluded to it earlier, is the opportunities that once you start to leverage your cash flow that open up to you. Like, uh, can you speak on that? Yeah. You know, let's start with the foundational piece of it. If you have access to capital, you will spot opportunities every week. If you don't have access to capital, even if you thought you were looking for opportunities, you wouldn't know one if it's matching the face. Having access to capital drastically changes the, the lens in which you view life moving forward. So you could leverage, here's an example. Let's say you've got $100,000 of equity in your home, right? And, and I'm just going to use real estate as a topic. And you're buying $100,000 properties in your market, right? There are two bedroom, one bath, and you can get a $500 margin between the cost of funds versus what you rent it out for. You've got $100,000 in equity and you buy $100,000 properties. How many properties can you buy with that $100,000? You're, you're asking me, so two, right? You're buying two properties. No, no, no. Oh, I'm glad you said two. At least it's yeah. better than what most people say. Most <laughs> people say if I if I got a hundred grand and I'm buying hundred thousand dollar properties, well, I've only got enough to buy one property. Mm -hmm. Wrong leverage, right? Mm -hmm. So if you're buying rental properties, it typically requires a twenty percent down no, payment. Amen. So yeah. now, if we're buying hundred thousand dollar property, <laughs> right? Well, how much can we chop up the hundred grand five ways? Yeah. So now I can buy five properties instead of one. Right. And you've diversified your risk, too. So if you've got one property that's only netting you 500 bucks because you paid cash for it with your home equity line of credit. Well, now you've got a cash flow of 500 bucks. But what if you have a vacancy? OK, the 500 bucks went away. The flip side of it, leverage the right way is now you got five properties bringing in 500 apiece. Now you've got an additional twenty five hundred dollars of income. But let's say you do have a vacancy. Still got two grand coming in, right? So you've diversified your risk as well. But this is one of the ways that you can scale your side hustle if it's real estate. And I'm just using that one as an example to scale your real estate portfolio to fire your boss. So let's say you're making, you know, five grand a month uh, as a W-2 employee. And you're like, all right, well, I've got to replace the five grand. Well, in that scenario, you need 10 properties. And it may not happen all at once. But, you know, there's some other things, too, that we teach inside of Replace Your Employer a lot of people don't realize that in real estate investing, more often than not, you don't utilize any of your own capital. Again, we go back to what we teach in Replace Your Mortgage, arbitrage. There are lots of people like myself. Uh, I'm not a, a big into real estate. You know, when we teach it, it's Nate and, and uh, or Dr. Nate and Edmund Fontana that are teaching the real estate thing. They've built massive portfolios. They're the experts in it. If I'm not an expert in something, I don't actually do it myself. I'm not going to be the one teaching you on that. So they teach that and 100 plus properties in, in each of their portfolios, or at least Nate's and, and Edmund's his mentor, and he's building his way up very quickly. You know, it may take two or three years to get to 10 properties. You got a two or three year plan if it's real estate related to now have the option to fire your boss. Now, you can also leverage your home equity. Like this is what I'm a, a big proponent of is I've got seven different businesses so if I've got cheap cost of funds there, because on my home equity line of credit, we, we have four different strategies to keep borrowed funds below 5%. So a lot of your viewers are like, yeah, I mean, it sounds good, but HELOCs are variable. Not true. So they're fixed as well. They're also mm -hmm. hybrid. They don't have to be variable. Uh, and the interest rates are high. Not true. Actually, right now is really the best time that we've seen in our nine-year tenure of teaching the strategy 
of promo rates hitting the market. So banks are flooding the market with these stupid low promo rates. So my personal situation is my HELOC. I've had 1.99% for the last three years running. And when it runs out, guess what I'll do? I'll go to another bank and get another promo. And I'm just keeping my cost of funds really low. So back to the original point is leverage. So if I, my cost of funds is 2%, there are so many opportunities out there with my liquid capital that I could earn 10, 14, 20%. All right. I also funnel money into, so how can you make money in two places? I funnel money from my HELOC into what I call my IBC policy, right? It's an insurance policy and it's also a family trust. So my wife, who's also an entrepreneur, spotted a, um, it was a Mexican restaurant, but uh, it was, uh, it was vacant. And she's like, I, I want to take this location and renovate it for, she owns women's boutiques and home decor. And she's like, I want to take this uh, location. I want to renovate the inside of it to look like the inside of a farmhouse. And I want to, you know, stock it with inventory of women's clothing and home decor. And uh, it was at a great location. And uh, she's like, I ran the numbers and it's going to cost about $100,000 to renovate this property. I was like, all right, yeah, we can afford that. And she goes, we ain't doing anything. <laughs> and this was in my hometown. She's like, this town is very cliquish. People know you. They know what you do. So if I'm successful, all they're going to do is say yes, because her husband bankrolled her, right? Mm -hmm. She's like, I don't want that excuse. Even if people don't know how I'm doing it, I want the pride in myself that I'm doing it myself. Mm -hmm. So she went and got 0% business lines of credit, uh, which is something else we teach too. And um, she got hundred grand to renovate this building. Opened up, been successful. Mm -hmm. In the first year, she drove it down 40 grand, um, and it's now at a 60,000 dollars balance, but these promo rates are about to expire. So instead of going or zero percent and having whatever her minimum payment is that her business had to pay for the that 60,000 of debt, it was about to explode because the interest rates were going to go from zero to 18 to 24 percent, which is going to inflate the minimum payment, costing her business more money. So I said, look, honey, this family trust, You've been just as a, a proponent and contributing to it as I have. It's as much yours as it is mine. Here's what we can do. Let's borrow from ourselves because we're the bank. And this is the family trust. And I, I said borrow from. I didn't say take money out. That's, that's a key term in infinite banking concepts. So we're going to borrow from it. We're going to create a note and a contract between us and our trust that we, have, we take money out and we will pay it back in over time which cool story. If you're borrowing money from your own bank, how much interest would you charge yourself? Well, if it's all coming back to me as much as possible. Good answer. Yes. I can tell you're a student <laughs> as yeah. much as possible, right? Most people yeah. say they think like a consumer. They don't think like a bank. So they say, well, as little as possible. No, you get the interest. You know, in every transaction, when it comes to borrowing funds, there are four people in that transaction. There's the bank owner, the banker, the borrower, and the depositor. Out of those four, what do you think is most important? Some people say, well, the bank owner. Well, then if you got a bank owner, but you don't have a bank or a banker who's actually doing all the, the work for you, well, then you don't really have a business. Well, if you don't have the depositor, then you can't be the one that's the lender. So really, they're all important. When in our system, it's you are all four parties. You are the borrower. You're the banker, you're the bank owner, and you're the depositor. Did I say depositor twice? The lender. So we lent money to ourselves. So our cost of funds on that to the trust was 4%. But we needed to save the business money. So we didn't charge the business 18 or 24% because it needed to be a net tangible benefit to the business, really to pass a sniff test with the IRS too. So we needed to charge the business interest and we wanted to charge as much as possible. So we settled on 14%. So it lowers the payments to the business, making the business more cash flow positive, right? And we consolidated that debt. It's still a tax deduction to the business because it's still a loan that the business has to pay back, right? So they maintain tax deductions as well, actually better because they were at 0%. Now we went to 14%. So the tax deductions are, are better. It's not as good as if you were paying 18 or 24%, but it's still better than 0%. So we get the tax deductions and improve the cash flow of the business. But here's the cool thing. Our cost of funds was 4%. And going back to the original quiz, but we lent it out at 14%. What is our rate of return? 
I'll just tell you. Yeah, yeah, tell me. Because I'm trying to do the math in my head. 240%. 240%. How many people right now with their 401ks and IRAs are looking at the market today? Um, it was when I last looked at it, it was almost down 400 points, right? That's just historic for 2022. Uh, if you got a 401k and IRA, you're, you're like, you're feeling the pain, right? Especially if you're on the heels of retirement, you're like, oh, okay. Based on this market, I'm probably going to have to work another two or three years and let this thing rebound so that I can retire. So you're, you're really getting hit. And even if you weren't in 2021 or, or uh, let's say 2019, right, before COVID, you know, you're, you're looking at it and you're getting good rate of return. What's a good rate of return? 10, maybe 15%, you know, at 15% if you're into some things that are really risky or the mythical 12% mutual fund that Ramsey talks about. So that, that's, that's like best case scenario. We just got 240% rate of return. Here's the cool thing. This is in an insurance policy. And there are four tax codes that eliminate uh, insurance from taxation. So really what we did, and I'm using a, a term here that I hate to use public, I'm just a, a better term that may be more compliant evades me right now. But we siphoned money from the business into our trust and grew at 240% all tax-free. I mean, how cool is the concept? Best, the best so now financial model, model ever. <laughs> yeah, now my dollars are in two places at once. And here's the other thing. I borrowed from the policy. I didn't take money out of the policy, right? Mm -hmm. So the funds didn't drop 100 grand or 60 grand, technically, that, that we borrowed from it. It didn't drop 60 grand. The original balance stayed the same. And if you look at these mutually owned whole life companies that are offering these specific type of products, they've paid out four to 6% dividends like clockwork every single year for almost 200 years. So you can't quite legally call it guaranteed, but it's about the closest thing that you can get to guaranteed. So we have what's called uninterrupted compounding interest, right? So like, again, this market that we're in, your 401k is going down. Even if next year you got 10%, what is the real growth? If you lost 20% the year before, you're still in the whole 10% from the previous year. This uninterrupted compounding interest, free from taxation and highly liquid. I can access my trust within three days. It's not as liquid as my home equity line of credit but it only takes three days for funds to be wired from my trust into my personal account. Wow. Wow. Uh, well, thank you. Thank you, Michael, for all this uh, mind blowing. I'm sure it's mind blowing information for a lot of the, the people on this, listening to this or watching this video. How, like, it's a no brainer to me for anybody watching this or listening to this to get in touch with you. Um, unless they're already got all this dialed in, which most people do not. Right. Uh, so, given a fraction of what it is that it took us nine years to figure out. So uh, my question is, how do they reach out to you to find out more about Replace Your Mortgage or, or, or Replace Your University? And I know you also have something, a big event coming up. So if you could talk about that. Yes. Yeah, so it's the first that we've ever done. We've done physical events. Um, you know, the latest one we did was in Salt Lake City, actually outside of Salt Lake City in Snowbird, Utah at a, a resort. And uh, we had you know hundreds of people come in. They had to buy tickets for hundreds of dollars. They had to get on me. It, it took me five and a half hours just to fly from Nashville to Salt Lake City. So thousands of dollars in airfare. And, and I don't really like to go anywhere without my family and kids. So that was really expensive to, to fly out there. Plus, you got to get the lodging, which we're at Snowbird uh, Resort, mm -hmm. which is not cheap. So that cost thousands of dollars. And really in 2023, we're moving to a different model where we want to have more impact. We want to reach more people and not just leave this exclusive to people who've got an extra five grand to spend on an event for three days to come and watch. So we're doing a virtual event starting Monday, January 9th, and it starts at 5 p.m. Central Standard Time. And we're going to go over each of these topics in depth for one hour each day. So I'm not asking a full day. We're just saying that at the end of the workday at 5 p.m., tune in. We're going to go over one topic of information, and then I'm going to leave an hour after that to answer any questions that um, anyone may have about that topic. And we're going to do that for five days. So Monday through Friday, starting on January 9th at 5 p.m. And, and here's the price. Uh, uh, sound like uh, 
feel like I'm Tony Robbins or I'm do something <laughs> or Marshall or QVC thing. It's 97 bucks. I don't care about the 97 bucks. I, but the thing is, we were asked a question, why not do it free? People wouldn't show up. You need to invest in yourself. And you guys understand that as entrepreneurs, you've invested in Doug and probably other mentors. I do. Um, I shared publicly uh, not long ago, I spent $27,000 a month and not just me, also the company too, on consultants and coaches per month. And I know that sounds like a big number and I've got other coaches and mentors that also have coaches and it's not a big number. It's all relative, right? That it's, it's a big number for me, but it massively changed the trajectory of our business and the rate of return. I can't even, I can't even calculate the rate of return because they're helping us spot blind spots that we didn't even know we had by having these mentors. So we, we needed to charge something. So it's 97 bucks. We're, we're not making any money on people buying $97, but we wanted, we wanted you to be able to invest in yourself at a very low cost to get access to this information. Now, yes, so link. Yeah, yes. the link. Yeah. I know you're probably going to ask me. The link is create your own economy live.com. Actually, Doug, you've got a link. You need to post in the description. Yes, um, I'll, I'll post that. Um, yeah. One question about this event. Is this is this a one-time only event or will you be doing this more than once? Uh, I feel like this will be a, uh, something that is a good model for us so that I can have more impact. You know, uh, it's, I'm blessed enough that our current business model, um, I wouldn't say I could ride off in the sunset, but, you know, it's it, it's lucrative enough and I'm, I'm blessing enough lives that I could be comfortable with that. But this one is one that I'm really passionate about because instead of me just focusing on my local market and whatnot, I can really get a broader reach by doing these virtual events. So we do anticipate doing more in the future, but we don't have a set date for that. We're just game planning this one and structuring everything. So we've planned for this one event that starts on Monday. The, the reason I ask that is because this is going to be an evergreen podcast, right? So um, that link may may change. I'm not sure. Um, the price of the event may go up. We don't know. Um, <laughs> um, but it, it's important to, to get started now. Right. Um, if whenever you're listening to this, get started now. It, the best time to plant a tree. The whole thing, <laughs> right? It yeah. is, is is now. You could have planted it 20 years ago, but plant it now. Yeah. So um, definitely uh, get registered for this event. That link will be below. Um, I'll also include links to uh, Replace Your Mortgage and um, some of your other stuff too, so that, that that's available to them as well. So awesome. Uh, I any, any parting words of wisdom for our entrepreneurs? You know, you're an entrepreneur, so you're already a risk taker. And, you know, the thing that really bites entrepreneurs in the butt more often than not, and again, I'm not the an expert in this field, just because I, I found success in this. I've got other businesses. Like I mentioned, I've got seven businesses. Five are really good, two suck, right? So that doesn't make me an expert in, in all things entrepreneur, uh, entrepreneurship. But one thing that's really hit home for me recently is procrastination is in execution is really what gets in the way for most people, right? They have two fears. The, the one is fear, the lack of knowledge and confidence to move forward in the right direction. The other one is time. Um, and really, that's what we're trying to do as entrepreneurs is we're trying to buy back time. We're trying to create our own economy that is bulletproof from recession, interest rates, inflation, um, that that's why we became entrepreneurs is we want we're, we're trying to do what we can to not only impact lives, but have more time to do the things that we want when we want without oversight and regulation. Right. So the biggest step for me that's really been hitting home for me recently, I've been getting up at 5 a.m. and working out. I've abstained from alcohol. You know, I got New Year's Eve. I started on December 26th, no alcohol. And I host a New Year's party at my house and, uh, you know, get 30 people there and they're staying there. We don't want anybody driving if they're drinking or whatnot. And um, I, I made it a point that I'm still not even going to drink for New Year's Eve. And, you know, a lot of people do that. But there's also a lot of people that don't, you know, that don't abstain during New Year's Eve. But I just made that commitment. And I said, I'm going to compound this challenge, too. And when everybody else is asleep, I'm getting up at 5 a.m. on New Year's Day and I'm going to go work out. So what constantly played in my mind to prevent procrastination was I only have to make one decision at a time. So when the alarm goes off at 5 a.m., just get out of bed. Don't think about working out. Don't think about packing your bag and making sure you got toiletries and everything for the shower. 
Um, don't even worry about your outfit that you're wearing that day. Don't worry about what is after the workout. Only thing you have to focus on right now in this moment is don't let comfort and sleep win this decision today. Just get vertical. Just get out of bed. That's all I had to do. And again, from December 26th to today, it's 5 a.m. like clockwork because I'm making one decision when I wake up. Don't look at the phone. Don't read emails because all I'm doing is creating space and a buffer between when I wake up to the decision. And that buffer is when I start negotiating with my mind of, well, actually, if I slept in, I could really get this done later and, and whatnot. Don't allow those negotiations to creep in. Just make the decision. I'm not making any other decisions after this. I'm just going to get vertical and I'm going to get out of bed. And what happens every time I get vertical is like, all right, yeah, all right, well, yeah, let's go pack the bag then. All right, now let, let me get my shoes on. Now let me get my toiletries and whatnot. All right, now let's just drive to the gym. One decision after another is compounding a very good physical effect for me. And that's just working out, right? And then, you know, abstaining from alcohol. And I don't have an issue with alcohol. I do like to partake in it. I love bourbon. So if you follow me on any of my <laughs> Here at the office, we've got a magnificent bar. Actually, Derek, our sales manager, has got his own bar in his office, too. <laughs> we love bourbon, but I, I'm not doing it this month. And so it's, it, it's just one day at a time, and it's it's right there in my face. But I'm just like, yeah, no, I made a commitment. So I'm j- just right now, this decision, I'm not going to do it. And usually after a really good, productive day, we'll sit down at the bar, and we'll break bread and talk to each other and have a bourbon. Not happening. And that decision has led to, you know, Edmund, actually, Edmund was the, the catalyst for it. He's not doing it. Derek's not doing it. Matt's not doing it. Now Derek is, or not Derek, uh, Edmund's reading a book, uh, Alcohol Explained, which he shared with me. Now I'm reading it. And guess what? Now I'm thinking January is going to turn into February. February is going to turn into Q1, maybe Q2. And that's really Edmund's mindset too. So it's one decision at a time that is the catalyst for really good growth. So, you know, if, if you're watching this, just make that decision. I promise you, you're going. If you watch this event, I'm only asking for one hour a day. You're going. I have never met anyone on the phone when they call and say, "Yeah, I know what you do. I, I can pretty much explain it to you." <laughs> I have a seven question test that I give them. No one can pass it. I promise you. If you watch this event, you're going to walk away with massive value and nuggets. It's really going to organize your personal finances. That if you organize your personal finances, imagine what it can do for your business finances too. Wow, such sound advice. One decision at a time. That's really what it boils down to, right? And um, what I always say is keep moving forward. And that's the way to keep moving forward is to make that sound decision one at a time. Uh, right. Thank you so much for that. And make sure that you attend that event. Uh, the link will be below. It's only $97. Come on, you're entrepreneurs, $97, right? It's it's a very small investment that could really change your life, change your perspective on so many so different you things. You don't even get the 97 we give it away. I mean, you know our, our platform. We give yeah. it away. We're not even collecting the $97. We just want you to show up so we can help you. Yeah. 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 $97 is really just your payment to just not make the excuse not to show up, right? My ESP. So, uh, uh, yeah. 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 Um, awesome. Awesome. And thank you. Thank you so much for this. Um, it has been so, so much good information. And um, and until next time, Pearl Blazers. Keep moving forward. Thanks, Doug. Take care. God bless.